already this morning. Uh, I'm going to be sharing with you this morning. I want you to write this down. The Lord watches your giving and your treatment of others. So I had to put a title on it. The Lord watches your giving and your treatment of others. But before we get started, this uh, little story came across my desk here a while ago, and I said, I'm going to use that someday. So the Salvation Army realized that it had never received a donation from the city's most successful lawyer. So a Salvation Army volunteer paid the lawyer a visit in his lavish office. The volunteer opened the meeting by saying, Our research shows that even though your annual income is over $2 million, you don't give a penny to charity. Wouldn't you like to give something back to your community through the Salvation Army? The lawyer thought for a minute and said, First, did your research also show you that my mother is dying after a long, painful illness and that she has huge medical bills that are far beyond her ability to pay? Embarrassed, the volunteer mumbled, Oh, no, I didn't know that. Secondly, said the lawyer, my brother, a returned serviceman, is blind and confined to a wheelchair and is unable to support his wife and six children. The stricken volunteer began to stammer an apology, but he was cut off. Thirdly, did you also, did your research also show you that my sister's husband died in a dreadful car accident, leaving her penniless with a mortgage and three children, one of whom is disabled, and another has learning disabilities requiring an array of private tutors. The humble volunteer completely beat and said, I'm sorry, I, I had no idea. And the lawyer said, so if I didn't give any money to them, what makes you think I'd ever give any money to you? <laughs> don't be that way. Look at the person next to you and say, don't be that way. Don't tell God how big your storm is. Tell the storm how big your God is. Amen? Amen. You know, there's some people, they go through life and they, they, they just don't get it. But I was reading this from the time I was uh, 20 years old, and I would read this about Jesus watching our giving. All the way through the Bible, from the beginning to the end, there's stories about people giving. There's a story in the Old Testament that is, has a lot of significance. It's found in Jeremiah 38, 1 through 13. I'm not going to read the story, but I want you to read it when you get home. And there was a man by the name of Jeremiah who had went to his nation, and he had told them, listen, you guys got to stop doing the stuff you're doing because God can't bless it. If you keep doing those things, what's going to take place is your nation is going to crumble from within. They said, we don't like hearing him. Put him in a prison. Put him in a prison and bury him up in mud all the way up to his shoulders. Just leave his head above and maybe he'll change the message. They'd go see him periodically and they'd say, well, has the message changed? He said, no, the message has not changed. If you don't stop doing the things you're doing as a nation, God is going to send judgment. So you've got to stop doing those things. <laughs> well, after a period of time of being in the rats, with the rats and with the mud and all of that, there was a guy by the name of Abednelech, an Ethiopian eunuch, who had, had a lot of things taken away from him. He couldn't have children anymore. He was taken away from his people from Ethiopia, so he couldn't be there anymore. But this man looked at Jeremiah in the pit, and he said, you know what, it's not right to leave a man in the pit for telling the truth. He said, we've got to get him out of there. And he went to the king who had put him in the pit, and he said, king, you're not right for putting this man in the pit. He's done nothing wrong but tell me the truth. You have to do right by him. So they take Jeremiah, this is Abedmelech, and he gets all these rags. How many of you ever read the story, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your hair? Did you ever read those stories about where they're always pulling ropes out of castles and dropping ropes down and pulling people up? Well, where do you think they got those stories? They got those stories from the Bible. Well, there was a guy, this guy, Abedmelech, he takes all these rags, he ties them together, and he says, Jeremiah, put these under your arms. And he pulls Jeremiah out of the pit. So I want you to write that down in your Bible. Those are cords of love. God uses people to pull you out of the pit, okay? Those are cords of love. Now, he didn't have a nice rope that could go under Jeremiah's uh, armpits with uh, nice leather slings and that he had rags that God used to pull Jeremiah out. 
Now, let's fast forward to Jeremiah 39, verses 15 through 18. I want you to see this. God watches over your giving and your treatment of others. And if you treat people wrong, it's going to come back your way. But if you treat them right, that comes back your way also. That's right. Now just so you know, God doesn't always pay back on Friday. Look at the person next to you and say, God doesn't always pay on Friday, okay? You don't always get a check every two weeks, okay? Or once a quarter. But it always pays to serve and do what's right in God's eyes. Fast forward now. Jeremiah's out of the pit, and here's what takes place. Jeremiah 39, 15 through 18. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to Abimelech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, The God of Israel, behold, I will bring my words upon this city for evil and not for good. And they shall be accomplished in that day before thee, but I will deliver thee in that day, saith the Lord. And thou shalt not be given into the hand of the men of whom you are afraid, for I will surely deliver thee, and thou shalt not fall by the sword, but, the, but thy life shall be for a prey unto thee, because thou hast put thy trust in me, saith the Lord. Abedelech did not have to go into captivity because he had done what God had told him he needed to do, and that was to help another person who was in need. Take a turn with me to Job 34, 21. I want to give you some supporting scriptures on this so when you go home, you have something to work with here. God's watching how you treat people, your enemies. He's watching how you treat your family. He's watching how you treat your neighbors. He's watching how you treat people in church. He's watching you and I very closely to see. It's not just about the money. Tap the person on the shoulder next to you and say, it's not about the money. Just, just some money. It's not about that. Don't be like that Salvation Army lawyer. Don't be like that guy, okay? Be willing to give. And we're going to see some of the things that Jesus is watching over. Job 34 and verse 21 says, For his eyes are upon the ways of man, underline the ways of man, and he sees everything he does. Let's look at Jeremiah 16, 17. For mine eyes are upon all their ways, are upon how many ways? Wow. All their ways, for they are not hid from my face, neither is their iniquity hid from mine eyes. Third scripture, Zechariah 4.10. God's watching even over the little things in our lives. I tell the story, but it's a true story. I went up here to the corner to get some chips and pop. I have an affinity for chips and pop. I don't know if anybody else has that, you know, but... I like uh, Fago Cola, Pepsi Cola, I don't like, Coca Cola, I love, and better made potato chips. Everybody's not, they don't want to talk about it. Maybe a very cherry cola goes good too, you know. So I went up there and I uh, got, uh, there's uh, some other people standing in line ahead of me and they recognized who I was. They said, oh, Pastor, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So I thought, oh, these guys really are being nice to me, okay? So I get my stuff, and I get out to the car, and then I remembered I didn't get everything I wanted. Well, I went back in, and there were people from local churches buying lottery tickets, okay? <laughs> <laughs> they weren't being nice to me. What they were doing is they didn't want me in their business, okay? Yeah. I wouldn't have said nothing to them. I mean, it's your money. You can spend it on whatever you want. But Joni and I had been doing that Wheel of Fortune. We write the numbers down after Wheel of Fortune, and... You know, we, this is a little thing we've been doing now for two, three years. See if we can pick out the right three digit or four digits. How many of you ever did something like that? Out of 1,000 times, guess how many we got? <laughs> Nothing. <to pay. laughs> I've never bought a lotto ticket. If I went up to the counter, I wouldn't know how to buy a lotto ticket. But my point is, look at Zechariah 4.10. For who hath despised a day of small things? Everybody say small things. Small things. For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. These are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. God even sees small things. Mm -hmm. Once you reach in your pocket, 
And I want you to take out three pennies if you got three pennies. Anybody got three pennies? I need these girls right up front here. Come on up here, honey. I want you to hold these three pennies for me, okay? All three of you, each take a penny, okay? All three of you, three of you take a penny, okay? I want you to stand up. Three pennies, okay? Let's go to Mark chapter 12, 41 through 44. Jesus sees what? Small things. They each got a penny, right? Now, we're going to see what Jesus saw here. Mark 12, 41 through 44. And Jesus sat over against the treasury, that's where the money was counted, and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. But there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites. Two mites is two, 2.8 cents, so not even three pennies worth. Jesus saw that. Which made a far bane. And he called unto him his disciples, you can be seated, girls. You can keep the pennies, that's from your pastor. Okay? <laughs> and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you that this poor widow has cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in of their abundance. But she ever one did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Three and a half cents, or less than three cents, is all she had. Poor widow, only a fraction of three cents. Jesus calls, says, says, hey fellas, I want you to come look at this. All this money that these other ones threw in, it was nothing to them. They had tons of money. Donnie, my friend back there in the sound room, says he has a friend that lights his grill with $100 bills. Being the kind of nice to, be, to do that occasionally, wasn't it? No. No, no not really, amen? <laughs> See, God, you don't have to worry about your money if God has you. If God has you, guess what he has? He has your money, amen? amen. So Jesus says, fellas, I want you to see this. You're looking at those big piles, but they didn't give nothing. They didn't cost them nothing to give that. They don't have one mule or two mules. They've got thousands of mules. They don't have one cart. They've got hundreds of carts. They don't have one house. They've got houses all around Israel and Judea. And they've got them all over the place. They're not hurting at all. But this woman, she could have hung on to everything, but she didn't do that. She said, no, I'm going to give it away because God can touch people's lives with this. And that's the purpose of money, to touch people's lives with it. Amen? She put everything she had to live on in there. Now I want you to write this down, the law of sowing and reaping. Galatians 6, 9. We're not just talking about money here. We're talking about actions you have towards people. I've had people say, I don't have any friends. You know why you have any, don't have any friends? You're about as grumpy as a gun. You're meaner than a junkyard dog, okay? Nobody wants to be your friend like that. If you want to have friends, the Bible says you have to be friendly. Let's look at Galatians 6 9. Here's the law of sowing and reaping. Back up to verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. And let us not be weary, let us not give up, is what he's saying, in doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not. You can't quit. Take and turn with me to 2 Corinthians 9, 6-15. But this I say, verse 6, He which sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly, and he which soweth bountifully shall reap also bountifully. Every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give, not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. You guys really don't know me. Uh, years ago I preached a message, and I had a big old bag of seed, Mandy, and what I would do is I would walk through the church, and I was throwing the seed all up and down, 
church, just throwing all this seed. I had about five, ten pounds just throwing it like this, okay? How many of you were there when we remember me doing that, okay? And everyone kept saying, it's going to get messy. It's going to get messy. And I just kept throwing all the seed, just like this, all the way through the church, just throwing it. I made it janitors. They had fits that day, okay? <laughs> just throwing the seed all over the place. I wanted them to remember something. If you only plant three seeds, what are you going to get? Just three little plants, okay? But if you sow abundantly, you're going to get it back abundantly. And I don't just mean money. This is what I want you to see today. The way you treat people, if you just sow it sparingly, that's how it's coming back to you sparingly. Every man as he purposes in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. That word there means hilarious. <laughs> hilarious. I love that. It's a wonderful life. Remember where the guy's going to jump off the bridge? Remember that? And they start, the guy, Uncle Billy keeps pulling the lever and they're counting the money. Finally, the tax collector comes and he takes his watch off. He takes his money. He just throws it all away. Because he finally got it. It's not about how much you have. It's about how many times you can bless other people with your life. That's right. Amen. Amen. Look at the person next to you and say, do you got it? Do you got it? Have you gotten that message? Let's look at this. You can read that passage when you get home. If you don't give, nothing's going to come back your way. Now in Matthew chapter 5, this is called the Beatitudes. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. And I want you to see some things this morning. Beatitudes mean attitudes that ought to be in your life. Some of our attitudes, frankly, just stink. <coughs> some of the attitudes people have just stink, yeah. including myself. We've got to change the attitude. Nudge a person next to say, man, you've got to change that attitude. Mm -hmm. Towards your husband, towards your wife, towards your kids, towards your neighbor. I mean, you, if you, you should sit in my seat sometimes in the office and hear some of the things people do battle about. Teacups. <laughs> They'll battle about little piddly things. The, their, their neighbor didn't cut the flowers quite right. The yard wasn't quite, cut quite, quite right. Someone dumped a load of topsoil on their front lawn and they didn't move the topsoil when they said they were going to do it. And all these little things that people fight over. I imagine God scratching his head. He said, I guess they just don't get it. Look at this. Seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What's it mean to be poor in spirit, Pastor? It means this, to realize that without God you have nothing. Mm -hmm. That's what a person poor in spirit <laughs> has come to grips with. Without Christ in my life, I have nothing. Number two, blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. What's he talking about? Blessed are those that mourn with others. Don't have a hard heart. Somebody's going through a tough time, mourn with them. Get involved in their life. Say, listen, the best to the best of my, my ability, I'm going to try to walk through this with you. It's very difficult. That's what makes a strong church is when everybody buys into this and says, you know what? I'm going to help other people in my sphere of influence that are going through a tough time because later on, they're going to be able to help me when I'm going through a there tough time. <laughs> the way you sow it out, that's coming back your way. Blessed are the meek. What's that mean, Pastor? That means blessed are the teachable. Some people, you can't tell them nothing. Why do you think so often in the Word of God, Jesus said, here again, this parable? Because they heard it the first time with this ear, but they never heard it with their heart. They never changed their behavior. So he said, you have to hear it again. Blessed are the teachable, for they shall inherit the earth. Verse 6, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. A lot of times people don't grow spiritually because they don't hunger after. What's he talking about here? Hungering and thirsting. How many of you have ever worked this past summer out in uh, just out in your yard of that and you just had to have a glass of water? Okay, had to have a glass of water. 
Just think of that, it would have been taken away from you. You cannot get that glass of water. You go to your neighbor and he says, I won't give you a glass of water. You go to your best friend and he says, I won't give you a glass of water. You go to your enemy and he says, I will give you a glass of water. What he's talking about there is, listen, if you hunger and thirst after something, you're going to go at it with the intention of getting it. Some people don't go after God with the intention of really knowing him. They just want a little bad old do you Christianity. Real green Christians. That's not going to help you out, okay? You, get, you have to go after God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Next verse. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Who's speaking here? Jesus. Jesus. He's watching their treatment of others. He's saying, listen, if you're not going to be merciful, then how can you expect God to be merciful towards you? Everybody wants judgment on someone else's uh, behalf, but they want mercy on their behalf. Amen. We need to have mercy on each other's behalf. Yes. Amen? Amen? Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to that day. We were at a wedding last night, and Sue, um, it's not Sue Allen anymore, but uh, Sue Smith anymore, but she says, do you know what? More likely Jesus is coming back this year. I said, Sue, I hope you're right. Then I started thinking about that. Is that, is that really right, a right response? Because I have family members that aren't Christians. I have nieces and nephews and aunts and uncles and other ones on both sides of my wife's family and my family that I want saved. Do I want Jesus to come? Absolutely. But I want my whole family to go up together with him. Amen? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. That means I have to keep my heart right. Jesus is watching my heart. Lord, is there something in your heart that isn't right? Is there some evil in your heart that isn't right? Then you've got to make that right. Can't keep that stuff in there. Blessed are the peacemakers. You want peace in your life? Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Wow. You mean if I want peace, I've got to sow peace? Absolutely. Ain't nobody going to tell me what to do. Do you know who I am? Yeah, that's a problem, okay? <laughs> that's a problem. But if we want peace, we've got to sow peace. That's right. Blessed are they which do are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely. Underline that. See, when someone says something against you falsely, that's when God gets involved. When they say something about you and it's truthful, guess what? God doesn't get involved. You, you have to realize that sometimes some of our problems, some of the situations we find ourselves in, is of our own doing. We've done them to ourselves. And that's why he's saying, if you're going to suffer, suffer falsely. That you really didn't do that, but someone didn't like you, and so they did it that way. And let God be the vindicator and clean up that problem that you got in your life. Amen? Verse 12. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. How many of you see this attitude? How many of you see these attitudes? How many of you see where some you need an attitude adjustment? Or maybe the person next to you needs that attitude adjustment. How many of you know what I'm talking about? See, a lot of it, it's a lot of our problems is ourselves. Yeah. And so we have to make the right attitude adjustment. Let's go on then. Here's the attitude we ought to have. Let's go to Exodus 35, 22, 27, and 29. Some people, like this rich guy that wouldn't give to the Salvation Army, some people are like that. You know, there was a story that's told about that Sky said, I'll give a million dollars to the person who can get one more drop of juice out of this orange. And they gave it to the strong maybe. <laughs> and they couldn't get any more out of it. So they gave it to another couple of young people. <laughs> and they couldn't get They gave it to the church treasurer and a couple drops came out, okay? <laughs> he was the only one who could get a little more out of it, amen? Sometimes that's how it is, all right? You're going to squeeze everything out. 
We don't want to do that. We want people to give and be a blessing in their treatment of others for one reason and one reason alone. As you sow it out, guess what? It's coming back your way. One person, thank you for Andy for that hand in the back. <laughs> Everybody else didn't get it, okay? <laughs> Exodus 35, 22 says this. And they came, both men and women, as many as were willing-hearted, and brought bracelets and earrings and rings and tablets, all jewels of gold, and every man that offered, offered an offering of gold unto the Lord. Are you following this? Go to verse 27. And the rulers brought onyx stones and stones to be set for the ephod and for the breastplate. Verse 29. The children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord. Every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. What made them willing, Pastor? I'll tell you what made them willing. When they left Egypt before they got to the Red Sea, they went and asked the Egyptians, can we have some of these things? And they said, listen. This God you serve is such a great God and there's been so many plagues in our uh, nation. Just get out of here and take all the stuff with you. So once they got out there in the wilderness, they realized one thing that we have failed to realize, that is this, that if God doesn't give it to you, you're not going to have it anyhow. Every breath, boy, this. In Him we live and move and have our being. That means in Him. He's the one that gives you your very next breath. We don't get it sometimes. We just don't get it. That if God doesn't give it to us, we don't have it. I'm a self-made man, Pastor. You are. Yeah, I went to school. And how much did it cost? Well, it cost thousands of dollars. Where did you get the money? Well, my parents gave it to me. I thought you were self-made. Where did they get it? Well, they worked at Ford General Motors Chrysler. They worked up. And I wonder if they didn't have health to go to Ford General Motors Chrysler. Or any place. Where did they get their money? I never thought about it. There are no self-made men and women. God is the one that blesses us. The Bible says promotion comes not from the east, the west, or the south, but promotion comes from the Lord. He puts one down and he raises up another. Amen? Dude, you know, God can touch your life in such a way that people just begin to do things for you and you don't even know why they do it. Because you've sown it out abundantly and people begin to bless you Abundantly. Amen? Take a turn with me. 2 Chronicles 24 10. We're almost to the end here. First Chronicles 24. <laughs> yeah, I know. I got it. I get it wrong occasionally myself. First Chronicles 29 10. Wherefore, David blessed the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, Blessed be thou, Lord God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Robin Ard, this is one of the favorite scriptures you've blessed me with through the years. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness, and the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is yours. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from thee, and thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might, and in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. For who am I, and what is my people, that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? Here it is, people. For all things come of thee, and of thine own have we given back to thee. Everything comes from God, people. And when we give gifts to that, guess what? We wouldn't even be able to give them if they did it first of all given times. We need to be the most thankful individuals and realize that the Lord is watching over our, our giving and our treatment of others. I want to leave two statements with you today. Your bank and credit card statements are theological documents. They tell who and what you and I worship. They really do. With the price of everything going up these days, we ought to be glad that the Lord hasn't increased the tithe to 15%. <laughs> See, he says you start there. Start by being a blessing. 
start saying, Lord, how can I be a blessing to somebody else? How many of you have ever been just dog tired? I was dog tired the other day I came home and I thought, well, I... Joey says, well, we got this to do and that to do. And I said, honey, I'm just tired of doing this and doing that for everyone else. I just want to sit down for a while. And then my heart says, no. Paul said, I'm willing to be spent, to spend and be spent for him. I'll go to the last step for him. So we get to the wedding and someone is playing a song that says, I'd walk 500 miles for you, baby. <laughs> I'm going to hear this song. I thought, if they walked 500 miles for a girl, how far should we be willing to walk for the Lord? Amen? I'll go the extra mile. Jesus said, if they can tell you to go a mile, go what? Two. <laughs> By the way, I don't think there'd be too many guys walk 500 miles for a girl. I'll tell you. They might start, but after a while, they say, where's the motorcycle? I'll just walk. It's <laughs> Amen. Well, people, are you getting it? Jesus is watching our gift. What's really important to you and I? Jesus watches how we treat people. Even the people, I mean, this Ethiopian eunuch who had nothing, God treats him with respect and honor. If we don't treat people correctly, then we can't expect God to treat us correctly either. Wonder if people have a lower station in life than you, Pastor. How should you treat them? I'm glad you asked that question. With respect and honor. They asked Mother Teresa, how do you minister on the leper colony? She says, those are all God's people. I love all of those people. And I wouldn't want leprosy, therefore, I'm going to be Jesus' hands to the leper colony. We have an opportunity. Jesus said, you look on the fields. They're white already on the harvest. People are looking to see if you are a Christian or if you're just a Christian in word. Do you practice what you preach? Someone was telling me the story, it was a youth friend about Bill Hybels, where uh, Bill Hybels had preached on a message about doing what was right and being a man of integrity, and he got on a bus, and the bus driver had given him change for a $50 bill, and he had only given the man a $5 bill. And he gave him change for a $50 bill. Bill Hybels got to the end of his route where he was going to be getting off, and he said he gave the man back this money, and he said, you know, you gave me change for a $50 bill, I gave you a five. And he says, yeah, I was at your teaching last night, and I just wanted to see if you practice what you preach. <laughs> people are watching. Look at the person next to you. People are watching. But say more than that, God is watching. That's right. Keep a life of integrity in there. Watch how God will bless you for doing what's right in His eyes. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You right now. We thank You, Father God, for this wonderful church. Thank You for these wonderful people that came here today. We thank You, Father God, that You love each and every one of us. You have a great plan for our lives. But Father God, we realize that there's things, there's inconsistencies.